We covered World War II. And now, of course, it's time to head even back further in time to World War one. One. Of course, but this time with a twist. That is indeed correct, my good fellow, because today Taylor and I are doing a collaboration challenge. I know, it's been a while. I wrote five, he wrote five, and then we're going to switch and then yeah. surprise each other. So you'll be seeing us react for the first time to these stories. I haven't read hers, she hasn't read mine, blah, blah, blah. We've been typing in secret in the office. Don't look, don't look don't at my look, stuff. Don't look, don't look. We might giggle, we might cry. These are some of the craziest stories from... World War I, and Taylor will most definitely cry. Probably. It's gonna be a game. I'm your host, Rachel Fisher. And I'm Taylor McWaters, and without further ado, let's count down our list of unusual events from World War I that make no sense, almost. Kicking off the list at number 10, Arthur Conan Doyle, the psychic. We love psychics. In 1912, Arthur Conan Doyle, who you may know as the author of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, did some sleuthing through time and space. Yeah, you heard me. He wrote a story called Danger, which revolved around the fictional nation of Norland attacking Britain. Norland starved Britain into submission throughout the use of submarines. Now the story overall describes a need for some kind of tunnel, otherwise Britain would fall. This story sparked public discourse, though there were skeptics such as Admiral C.C. Penrose Fitzgerald who wrote, I myself do not think that any civilized nation will torpedo unarmed and defenseless merchant ships. Alas, World War I arrived and he would home eat his words. On February 18th, 1915, Germany announced that every British merchant ship entering the British waters would be destroyed. Then in May 1915, the transatlantic linear Lusitania was torpedoed on its way to Britain and 1,200 people died. Needless to say, it was a tragedy, of course, but it's interesting that Norlin sounds a lot like Germany and his story was released before the war even started. That's wild. He's like a Nostradamus. He like predicted his own, I think the Simpsons, you predict the uh, real life stuff in their episodes. He kind of did that. Number nine, Matahari, the 27 year old Dutch dancer who became a spy. You heard me. Born in 1876, Matahari, real name Margaret. Zell married an army captain when she was 18 years old. Now the marriage was horrible. This guy was violent. Oh, I'm sorry. It didn't work, obviously. So Matahari, she split. She hit the road and decided she wanted to live like a colorful butterfly in the sun. But just what does that entail? Well, at age 27, Mata moved to Paris and reinvented herself as an artiste. She tapped into her Dutch roots and started performing dance acts under the alias Lady Gresha McLeod. She was the first dancer to go nude. It was a big deal. Her show, of course, got packed. She was the talk of many towns and for years she would travel to Europe and perform to these sold out crowds. But the most important factor here is the guys who would come out and watch. These military officers and aristocrats would give her gifts, anything they could. They loved her. And she loved moving around and dating these men. She was living her best life. Around 1914 she was a little older, around 40 years old, so the knees were starting to feel it. And also um, the war broke out. So that's a lot to deal with. Harry ended up being sent back to Holland at this point, was later approached by Karl Kromer. German council in Amsterdam because the men she was in contact with were considered a valuable asset. So she went from being a dancer to a spy. Code name H21. Number eight. Dr. Doolittle. Now it's time for a game called Let's Make Taylor Cry. Let's do it. The origin of Dr. Doolittle, with exception, this one does actually make sense. See, war is no place for kids, obviously. Even if they love battleships, boats, planes, whatever the case may be, it's no place for kids. Author Hugh Lofting promised that he would tell his children what it was like fighting in the war. However, the world of warfare entirely changed and introduced an entirely new horror, trench warfare. So instead, he came up with the character of Dr. Doolittle, a physician in the trenches who could, well, you guessed it, talk to animals. Not only did the stories delight his children, but they also kept the spirits of his fellow soldiers up. I didn't know this. This is very amazing. This is emotional. One soldier even said that his story saved his sanity whilst in the trenches. Hugh himself was a very shy, recluse man, and he found his voice through Doolittle, who could do the things that he could not. Throughout his life, Lofting suffered through mental illness and the death of his loved ones, but it was always his love for his family and animals, of course, that brought him back. Number seven. Adrian Cotton de Watt. I love this guy. I actually need to know this one. Sorry. Over the course of six decades and four wars, Lieutenant General Adrian Cotton de Watt, I have to say it like that, sorry, survived the impossible multiple times. He considered one of the most dedicated soldiers of all time because, for starters, after he lost his left hand, and his left eye, Adrian did not retire. In fact, the British Army officer went on to experience 10 more horrible injuries. As World War I broke out in November 1914, Carton was serving. He was opposing the forces of the Dervish state. In doing so, he was shot in the arm and face, and that's how he lost his left eye. But a grim detail shared by Lord Ismay, who served alongside the soldier, said in 1964 that the doctor at the time couldn't do anything about his eye, so he must have been in pure agony. I didn't know that. 
but also he's such a badass. Lord Ismay continues to believe that losing his eye was a blessing in disguise because the incident allowed for Adrian to relocate to Europe where even more action was waiting for him. Once stationed in Europe, Adrian received more gunshot wounds in the head, hand, stomach, groin, leg, and ankle all hit by bullets. And if that's not inspiring enough, he survived numerous plane crashes and a broken back? I didn't know that! If you, what? If you feel like reading more incredible details about the soldier and diplomat, there's a book on his whole life. I'm gonna read it. It's on my list. I love this stuff. Man. Number six, USS Cyclops, the ghost ship of World War One. I'm in. The mystery of the USS Cyclops is one that continues to boggle minds all over the world. The USS Cyclops was the first of four class ships built for the United States Navy preceding World War I, but either on or shortly after March 4th, 1918, the ship entirely disappeared along with a crew of 306 people. Poof, gone. Now when I say what it was near, you'll probably throw your head back and be like, ah, I get it, gotcha now. Now it makes sense. They disappeared in the area known as the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. But still, a ship of that size disappearing without a single trace? The Bermuda Triangle had its work cut out for her. She knew what she was doing from the get-go. To this day, it remains one of the single largest loss of life in the US naval history, not involving combat, of course. She was also carrying 10,800 tons of manganese ore used for munitions, so it was theorized that she was sunk by a German U-boat. But to this day, the fate of the ship remains unknown. Bermuda Triangle, phone home, let's go, let's talk. We got some questions. Number five, the frontline Flora Sands. We have to include this hero on our list. Flora Sands was the only British woman to fight on the front line during World War I. She was the youngest daughter of a country rector born in North Yorkshire in 1876, raised in Suffolk. She was known for being an adrenaline junkie growing up. She rode, she shot, and most of all, she was eager to leave her hometown. I get you, it's hard. She left the countryside for London and ended up working in a Cairo for a little bit. When she returned home to England, she learned how to drive, got herself a badass race car, and joined a shooting club. On her time off, she would train as a nurse too, just in case you weren't already impressed. Now, when 1914 rolled around, Flora was 38, and she immediately signed up as a volunteer to the St. John Ambulance Service and traveled to Serbia. Cut to a year later, Flora was now practically fluent in Serbian, so she transferred to the Serbian Red Cross, where she served on the front line. Because, yeah. Eventually, she was pushed to fight on the field, and at this time, the Serbian army was one of the only ones that allowed women to fight. Serbia? Yeah, okay. If you can do the job, do the job. And Flora fought. She rose to Sergeant Major, spread the word of the Serbian army, and all that she's been able to do to help became a celebrity, basically. But during a fight in Macedonia, Flora was injured by a grenade. But did she live? She died later, but she's 80. She was like older. Oh, she was old. Okay, cool. Y you go, Flora. Mm. Number four, a fake France. How in the heck do you keep a city that has over 2,000 years of history safe from one of the worst wars the world has ever seen? Well, simple. You build a fake one. Yeah, that's right, of course. A fake Paris, how easy. The Paris down the street, sans mustard. Basically a real life version of a souvenir snow globe. Now, a few months towards the end of World War I, Paris basically had a twin. The two cities of love. Military strategists were tired of seeing their beautiful city get destroyed, so they created a decoy. They built a life-size mock-up a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. They settled on an area just outside of the Masons Lafitte, which was nestled in the bend of the Seine, just like Paris which is pretty neat. Today you can visit Mason's Lafitte as an upmarket retreat because even though it's a fake Paris, it can still be just as expensive. That's how they do it. They built literal carbon copies of factories, iconic pieces like the Champs, entirely empty just for show. They even set up trick lights to make it look like trains were moving at night. The French put on a full scale version of what Kevin did in his house in Home Alone. Kevin would be pretty proud. Number three, no man's land. We mentioned trench life earlier in this list, so naturally I have to expand on the patch in between trenches, no man's land. The Smithsonian says there were tales circulating around these trenches over time. Apparently, deserters lived in no man's land. What? from both sides. They were said to dig tunnels deeper and deeper and only at night would they come out to scavenge off the dead. What? These tales began around 1920 when a British cavalryman, Ardern Arthur Holm Beeman, wrote about these German prisoners who would seemingly disappear into the trenches with other deserters. His officers then told him there won't be a search party because no living man shall be sent to the ghouls among the moldering dead. That's what? That's why I couldn't, what? Poet Wilford Owen described the land like the face of the moon, chaotic, crater ridden, uninhabitable, awful, the abode of madness. I read a book once where like a vampire lived in the world war and it was really cool. So maybe that's what this was about. Vampires are real. Number two, Sergeant Stubby. 
Okay, another round of Let's See If Taylor Cries, Tears of Goodness this time. Because we're talking about one amazing doggo. Sergeant Stubby was a real dog with real ambition. Oh, my heart. Air Bud played basketball. Stubby saved lives, so getting dunked on, kid. He was a member of the 102 Infantry of the 26th Yankee Division. Private Robert Conroy found this little brindle puppy that he decided to call Stubby because of his short tail. Animals weren't allowed on the base, but this doggo stole everyone's hearts, and he also took names. Yeah, he trained with them. He trekked through the barbed wire, even learned a little doggy salute. Hit that like button. Conroy smuggled him into the front lines, and even after he was discovered, nobody had the heart to let him go. Of course, they brought him to the front lines, and Stubby saved life after life. Real life. Okay, he was injured twice the first time by a gas attack. After he recovered, he had a heightened sensibility towards gas, which resulted in saving dozens of fellow troops from an attack that he sensed. He rescued fallen soldiers on the battlefield following the sound of English calls, even capturing an enemy spy. After this incident, he was promoted to Sergeant Stubby, my man. ST Stubby served and survived 17 battles, staying with Conroy even after the war. He finally passed away in 1926. The service was complete. Honestly, I knew he was gonna pass away, but it still hurt. Number one, spy fever. I just watched James Bond the other night, it's true I did, and now I'm in spy mode. Are they out there? Is Taylor a spy? Probably, we'll never know. Probably he is. Dead letter drops were used so spies could pass on documents or money, and what would happen is, you would find a hollowed out brick somewhere. It had to be public too to make it seem less spy kitty. So these spies would remove a brick from a wall, leave a note in it, put it back, and just continue throughout the day. Dead letter drops weren't only bricks either, if it was indoors, instead of a brick in the wall, it would be a hollowed out book. Or the back plate of a mirror. This was so common that around 1914, the civilians developed something called spy fever, where you were paranoid that there was a spy in your nation. Especially the early days of World War I, people thought spies were everywhere. Make sure you check out those old thick books tonight. <laughs> Could have a tape recorder in there. Listening to you while you read Fifty Shades of Grey. Ooh, you spicy, spicy girl. Guys, those are just 10 unusual events that went down during World War One, And of course, there's so many more that we would love to share. Yes, so many more. So comment down below if a part two is something you desire and we'll do the rest. Sick, I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. And I'm Rachel Fisher, and we'll see you next time on Boomblade B. Bye.